Welcome everyone for a new SIS masterclass powered by Sports Innovation Society. We will start with a conversation and meanwhile you can ask your questions on the Q&A part down on your screen. Uh, we will try to answer most of them at the end of the session of course. Every week, uh, every week at CIS Masters or CIS Masterclass we speak with leaders from all, all around the world in different fields. Today, we have a great international audience with executives from NFL teams, NBA teams, top leagues, top soccer clubs, media agencies, you know, from the US to New Zealand. And this great audience is here to listen to Scott Kigley, Executive Director and Digi of Digital Media and Innovation at Minnesota Vikings. Welcome, Scott. This session will be moderated by Mo. Thanks for having me. It's really good to be here with you guys. It's fantastic. Uh, this session will be moderated by Mo Hedari, former Chelsea Football Club head of digital, no MD at UI Centric. Welcome, Mo, and thanks again for your support. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arno. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, SIS has really become a staple in the sport biz world and I am very pleased to be able to do my bit and help support you guys, um, help support you guys again. So also my thanks to everyone for joining today's session wherever you may be in the world. We are living in a strange and uncharted time. This, uh, this pandemic for a short period took away something that I personally assumed to always be a constant in my life, and, and that was sport. And while it's coming back slowly, and there's been some good news about soccer here uh, in the UK and also the European soccer today, so that's exciting, the elevation that this pandemic gave to digital channels and digital communication on the whole was, was quite extraordinary. And, and I think this will have a direct effect on digital strategies moving forward. So with that in mind, I'm really excited that Scott is able to join us today and to, to delve into the world of Minnesota Vikings. So Scott, my welcome to you also. How are you, sir? How are you getting on? Yeah. Doing very good, as good as we can be right now. It's, um, it's certainly been a, a busy time for us on the, uh, the digital side of things, since that's kind of where everything has been, uh, been shifting. So never really been, uh, been much busier, uh, it seems like, the last uh, two, two and a half months now. Fair enough. Um, so uh, good to hear that you are well. Let's, let's get started, uh, if you don't mind. So I guess if I start with a fairly broad question, Scott, did digital often means different things to different organizations? So maybe if you could give us a little bit of insight into what digital media means to the Vikings and a little bit of clarity and insight about your role, please. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you a little bit about what, um, what I do at the Vikings and, and basically oversee uh, kind of four main uh, verticals for the team. So uh, we have an editorial team uh, of three writers. Uh, we have a digital platforms team uh, that's about uh, three people. Uh, and then we have a social media team, which uh, consists of three people. Uh, and then I'm also in charge of uh, mobile strategy uh, for the organization. But there's a, certainly a lot of people that work on the mobile side of things. Uh, work very closely with our, our analytics team there that handles a lot of the, the stadium utility uh, things that you guys might see in the Vikings mobile app and some of the different initiatives we have uh, at US Bank Stadium. Uh, and then also work uh, very closely with our uh, concessions and, and merchandise partners uh, at the stadium as well. So um, fairly broad, um, but uh, overall our digital team is uh, nine people plus myself. Thank you um, for that. Really good, uh, really good to hear that. I guess let's pick up the current situation. It's something that we can't, we can't really get away from with this, with this pandemic. How, how have you guys fared? How has it affected um, your general operations at the Vikings? Yeah, I think 
Um, you know, the, the current situation has certainly stretched, I think, what um, we all thought of, of digital content. Um, it's, it's given us, a, um, you know, for better or for worse, an opportunity to kind of rethink um, and reimagine uh, what the fan experience looks like now. Um, people are clamoring for sports content. They're as passionate uh, as they've ever been. Um, so for us, um, you know, we're thinking about it, you know, quite differently, especially, you know, on the NFL side, uh, probably different than, um, you know, a lot of other leagues. Um, the, the pandemic, the, the outbreak happened when we were in our off season. Um, so we didn't have to, you know, immediately cancel games and, and things like that. But the, uh, the NBA and the NHL and uh, Major League Baseball have gone on hold and, um, you know, some of the European uh, football leagues um, have had to go on hold. We, we actually happened, uh, that happened for us in the, in the off season. So a lot of the big questions were around um, the draft and the release of the NFL schedule. Uh, which is, you know, late April um, and then early May for the, the schedule release this year. So we were able to focus on those tentpole events and really figure out how we reimagine those uh, experiences. Um, you know, the draft was supposed to be held in Las Vegas. Uh, the NFL had some pretty um, extravagant plans for, for what that looked like and welcoming the, the Raiders to the city. Um, but the NFL did a fantastic job with a virtual draft and on the, the team side, um, you know, we did a, a live happy hour show uh, on the, you know, before the second day of the draft and did a Zoom call like this and, um, you know, brought uh, different um, players and uh, alumni into the broadcast. And, uh, you know, it, it was a very unique um, situation and people are, you know, broadcasting and they're broadcasting not from our brand new studio that we just built a, a couple of years ago in our new training facility. Uh, but people are at home trying to do this on uh, home internet connections and, and things like that. So the, those have been obstacles for us to, uh, to overcome, uh, of course. But I, I think that we've come up with some uh, pretty unique situations or pretty unique uh, experiences for people. Um, and, and I think that they're looking for, for more content from their teams um, right now and, and not less. And, and within that, did you did you prioritize any of the platforms that you you're on, any of the social or the o, o, um, the O and O platforms, or was it more of a case of try to try to feed the fans wherever they are? Yeah, um, to be completely honest, with a lot of the the programming that that we do and the situation, you have a finite amount of you know resources, and you know some of these shows. Uh, the, the team, we're not the only one doing these, these types of shows, um, but there's a lot of people who are um, on conference calls really trying to get those things done. Um, you know, as they are broadcast, you're not in a, um, in a control room. So our focus was if we're going to put, um, you know, this amount of effort into this happy hour show where our, um, our production teams also done the Vikings at home show. Uh, you know, which we are live on our social platforms. We want to make sure that it gets the um, the greatest amount of exposure uh, that we possibly can, and um, it's exposure for the the to the fans, um, exposure for our partners who are um, uh, on those shows uh, as well. So um, we've tried to uh, make sure that we can can stream that. Um, you know, the uh, the happy hour show that we did. Um, was broadcast on uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, our website, um, our mobile application, and then our connected TV application, Vikings Now. Um, so with, when we put that much uh, you know, staff and resources into something, we really want to be able to maximize exposure. Um, you know, there are some things that, that we do uh, you know, specifically on other channels that are outside the kind of that traditional you know, production that we, we try to uh, multicast uh, in a lot of different places, um, whether that's you know, kind of some uh, workout series that we've done with our um, cheerleaders or um, you know, announcement of kind of at-home activities um, and things like that. We also have some international uh, social media channels and, uh, you know, in Germany and the UK that are localized accounts um, on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook groups. Um, so we've had to kind of rethink our strategy there, too, uh, and how people want to interact with us. Um, 
on, on those channels as well. So there has been kind of, you know, some cases of focusing on unique pieces of content for the individual platforms, but we've really put a lot of uh, time and effort into some of these shows, that Vikings at Home show and then our Vikings uh, virtual happy hour show uh, that we've done and trying to, um, uh, you know, disseminate content in that fashion. And how about, how about yourself? How, on a personal note, how have you found the lack of other sports? I know certainly I've struggled a little bit, you know, as I said, sport was always such a constant. There was always something to watch, football, rugby, golf, tennis, but that sudden stop, I found difficult. How have you found it and how have you got around it, if at all? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been weird. It's been a change. Um, you know, even last weekend watching the match too, um, with uh with Tiger and Phil and um and Tom and uh Peyton. Um and I, I think I I heard that that was the most um viewed uh golf broadcast in the history of cable television. Um and I thought that that was uh amazing. Um, you know, it's not the Masters, it's not the the US Open. Um, it's not the PGA championship. Like the, they're literally playing for, for charity. They, they don't have a, a green jacket, um, on the line, but people are tuning in because they want to see people compete. We have a, um, uh, our tight end Kyle Rudolph, uh, on Saturday is participating in an all-star, uh, challenge that's broadcast on ESPN and partnered with Peloton, uh, which has kind of become, a um, cultural sensation of sorts uh, during the pandemic with that's how people are able to get exercise in. Um, and one of the companies that's doing, doing pretty well, I would imagine right now. Um, but he's competing against uh, Bubba Watson and, and Justin Thomas and, um, you know, some other really big names, um, you know, riding a, an exercise bike at home, um, you know, so definitely not something that you would have thought as, as live sports content um you know three months ago but you know here we are um and and i think people are uh you know they're clamoring for that they want to see that and uh they want to see people compete and i, I think it just gets back to what sports is all about and but yeah for me it's been uh, it's certainly been strange uh when things like the masters are canceled and, and you wake up and it's masters sunday and golf's not on tv so it's a, a strange strange world right now It is indeed, but hopefully some light at the end of the tunnel with uh, sport returning slowly. So that's that's a real positive. Let's put let's put um, let's put the pandemic aside. Let's now focus in on a non-pandemic uh, world. Uh, so I just wanted to, I suppose, get under the skin of how you guys go about planning out a typical year and a typical season. Um, how much of it is reactive? How much of it is proactive? Uh, maybe if you could just give us a little bit of insight about how 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 you go around and go about strategizing, it would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a combination of, of both things. Um, you know, being proactive and, and planning ahead on the things that you can plan for, uh, and then knowing that there's going to be a lot of moments during the season that you're going to have to be completely reactive, and making sure that communication. Uh, and the plan that you have in place um, is uh, bulletproof to the point that you can um, handle that when it comes, right? Um, so to give you kind of some examples, um, you know, we know that we're going to, uh, you know, open the season and, uh, you know, we're going to come up with a plan for, for week one and kind of what our campaign looks like going into the season and how to get fans, you know, fired up, right? Like that'll happen uh, every year, no matter who we're playing, no matter where we're playing. But each season kind of takes on a little bit of a life of its own. Uh, we know the the kind of the key games that we'll have uh, throughout the season are kind of primetime matchups, um, holiday matchups that we might have that we can strategize for, or just games that we know that fans are going to be, uh, you know, more excited for in general just because of the nature or the rivalries between teams. So there may be some things that we kind of start, um, you know, preparing for around those tent pole events. And then we really look at, our content calendar. The nice thing about uh, the NFL and, you know, I've worked in the NFL my entire career uh, and worked in, in college football, um, you know, when I was still still in college. Uh, so I've been in, in some form of football for, uh, 
you know, what around 19 seasons now. Um, so I guess I don't, I can't really speak to what it's like for major league baseball teams or, or NBA teams, but having talked to some of my counterparts uh, at those different teams uh, in those different leagues, the advantage that the NFL has, um, you know, from a content perspective, it's very cyclical. Uh, we know that, you know, typically we're playing on Sundays, sometimes a Monday, different times during Sunday, a Thursday game thrown in every now and then, um, you know, so those types of things uh, we can kind of plan for that week from, you know, Monday to Sunday. Uh, and that's what a typical NFL week looks, looks like. So we can plan our different content series going into the season. Um, we have a lot of different social content series. Um, how we engage fans from a push notification perspective throughout the week, when news typically comes out around injury reports, um, when pieces of content are posted. Uh, and for the most part, for uh, the NFL, it's kind of rinse and repeat in between, with a few things obviously changing in between. Uh, but you kind of know what to, um, to expect uh, from week to week and, and certainly things that, that you're going to have to react to. But there is a lot that we can be proactive with on the front end. That being said, there's a lot of moments um, that you can't uh, prepare for. Um, but you want to be able to have your team internally be able to react when that moment happens. So, you know, some examples, um, you know, we you have kind of a walk off when, um, you know, we had a, a huge playoff win. Uh, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later, a couple of years ago with the Minneapolis Miracle. Um, that happens. It's complete chaos on the field. Um, and so your team, uh, you know, is is used to, you go down to the field. Well, this is what happens when, if we win. This is what happens if we lose. These are the types of things and roles and responsibilities. Well, something that you didn't know that was going to happen, which is now the really the greatest moment in, in franchise history happens. Um, and you have to react to that. Um, and there's nothing that you could have done to prepare, um, you know, or really prepare for that moment. But you're prepared from the standpoint of, of you know who's doing what, you know uh, how to communicate between your team, uh, figure out what piece of content is, is kind of the most uh, important at that time. Um, and really, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a fire drill, but you're getting everybody together saying, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. This is how we're going to switch things up because this just happened. You good, you good, you good. Like, let's go. Um, and, uh, and make sure that the fans see all the great things that, uh, you know, either our social team or production teams, um, uh, captured and try to get out, get that out as, as quick as possible. So you're still going to have moments like that, no matter how prepared you are. Um, but we have a pretty good team, uh, you know, internally from our production teams to, you know, our digital, uh, teams to our game day entertainment team, our marketing and graphic design team that we work very, very closely with. Um, that's responsible for a lot of the things that you see on our social media channels. Um, so we work very closely with um, a lot of those folks. So it's really, you know, trust um, in those people to uh, to be there, um, you know, with you when the bullets are flying and then communication too. Great. Thanks for that. And really, really interesting what you say about those moments that you can't really plan for, because more often than not, they are, the, hu the most human bits and they are the bits that will garner the most interest and it is always a challenge and it is a constant challenge and that's uh, something we certainly faced at the club so because there's only so much planning you can do um anyway post season is also an important aspect from you guys uh point of view so can we just learn a little bit more about some of the campaigns and and what you're hoping to achieve on in, in terms of post season and why please yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, that's a, you know, one of the sayings in the NFL, that's a brand new season, right? So we treat it as such. Um, and, and because of that, if you're lucky enough to get into the postseason and you understand, um, you know, that that doesn't happen every year. Um, the NFL has so much parity that uh, when you're able to get to the postseason, you got to take advantage of it from a, a fan engagement standpoint. And it also elevates, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, um, you know, your brand from, you know, uh, you have like hyper local through, you know, a lot of games throughout the season um, and really put on a national scale and, um, you know, international broadcasts increase, um, you know, for those games. And, um, you know, it's seen by a, a larger percentage of the country. So 
you have to take advantage of that when you can. Um, and, and you're on a much bigger stage than you have been throughout the regular season. So um, one of the first times we really did that was going into, um, you know, this, the, um, uh, the season that we hosted uh, the Super Bowl is going to be hosted in, in Minneapolis. Um, and we, we talk a lot about what the messaging is going to be. We have a lot of different people, you know, in our organization that, that, that weigh in and in terms of, you know, how do we come up with something that is authentic? How do we come up with something that the fans are going to resonate with and the players are going to resonate with and ultimately fits the football message uh, you know, that our head coach and, and general manager and our team internally are trying to convey. Um, and that's pretty difficult to do. Um, you know, when you come up with a, with a marketing slogan, uh, you know, and you're just, you're kind of tossing around like what these, what these things could mean. Um, you know, it's sometimes, uh, you know, I always just say like, you know, these are just words like that we're, that we're making up, like, how do we make them mean something like that? You know, they have to mean something otherwise, you know, um, you know, you're just coming up with sayings. Um, and, and so one of the things that we talked about uh, going into that year, and we had somebody in our, our, our discussion um, that said, you know, like, hey, let's embrace home, you know, and, and kind of what home means um, for us. It's a unique situation. And so, you know, we talk with kind of all parties involved and um, kind of came up with some options and ultimately set, settled on the slogan, uh, bring it home. Um, and, uh, you know, that leads to then the discussion, you start from there. Um, and then you think about how you're going to kick this thing off and, and how fans are going to see it for the first time. And then our production groups involved and, um, you know, one of our producers, Nate Vaughn came up with a, uh, you know, a concept to really make it a lot more grassroots of a feel. So we sent out messages to, uh, the local mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul and, um, you know, to alumni, to uh, celebrities, uh, Snoop Dogg was in the, the video, um, you know, so we, we got a lot of people um, in, involved, other, um, you know, athletes, um, even from other cities, um, you know, uh, player up with the, the Winnipeg Jets sent in a message, um, you know, from the NHL. And it's cool to see a lot of that stuff come together. So we wrote a script, had people say different lines from it. And then we put this together. So we had a lot of different versions of those videos, some with alumni, some kind of like the main uh, kickoff piece. We got some of our players to say that too. Um, we got the city on board. Uh, all of downtown Minneapolis was lit up purple and gold. There's still some of my uh, favorite photos of the city. Our photographers did a fantastic job. Our team of photographers did a fantastic job of going around the city and, and, and capturing those moments. And we had drone shots of the city um, you know, we came up with t-shirts, um, and, uh, you know, beanies, knit, knit hats that we could, um, you know, send out to different influencers. So we sent those out to good morning football. Um, you know, the two weeks that we were, uh, we were in the playoffs. And so they were actually wearing some of that gear saying the saying, bring it home on air. Um, and you really started to see it, you know, grow from something like, yes, you had this, it started out as kind of this grassroots feel type of movement and, um, you know, uh, Minneapolis coming together to, to support the team in a, a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, we, did, we didn't want to hide from the fact that, you know, we could be the first team to uh, host a, um, a home Super Bowl. They wanted to, um, they wanted to talk about that. They wanted to embrace that, um, you know, from a football perspective. So that was really important. Um, you know, for, for, uh, so you saw it, um, take on that life. Ultimately, uh, we ended up losing, um, at Philadelphia the following week. Uh, but that first week that we were, um, we were at home and playing at us bank stadium and, um, they redecorated the entire stadium, all the, the field banners said, bring it home. Uh, so when case Keenum hits, uh, Stefan Diggs for a walk-off, uh, touchdown, it literally says, bring it home in the end zone. And that's the rally towels that, that people have. Um, and, you know, one of the things we talk about is it, it's got to be more than a moment. Like that moment was really special as a football moment. Um, but the impact that it can play in people's lives is immeasurable. Uh, right. So to be able to, um, to be able to capitalize on that and, um, you know, people who are at that game are going to remember it forever. Um, and hopefully they remember that campaign or even still have some of that gear that they can take as a keepsake. Um, we made sure that it lasted more than the, 
you know, uh, you know, five minutes that they're celebrating and it's sheer chaos on the field or whatever it was. Um, but we made sure that it, it lasted more than just that day, um, you know, because of that campaign. And, you know, the our teams didn't throw the uh, throw the pass or, or catch the ball or any of that type of stuff. But we, we can help it, um, you know, be even more memorable, uh, you know, to to some of our fans. And, and that's that's what's special. That's what we get to do that and kind of the, the reason that we we really love what we do. It's interesting how such an embryonic idea, such as bringing it home, can can generate such a fantastic campaign that becomes all encompassing and you know goes through to everything to to, to masks and t-shirts, as you said. So um, great to hear about that, and you know, obviously, very sorry about the eventual outcome on the field. <laughs> it would have been it would have been fantastic. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned players there, so. Um, and one of the things that was always a constant challenge at the club was gaining access to the players and being able to use them in in uh, collateral. How does player access usually work at the Vikings? Yeah, I mean, you obviously come in from your background to understand how that goes. And, um, you know, to be completely honest, um, you know, we have a great relationship with uh, with the players on on the roster and, um, you know, Vikings Entertainment Network, uh, which is the group that I fall under. Um, and maybe I should have mentioned that at the start, but Vikings Entertainment Network is kind of split into um, three or four, uh, you know, verticals, depending on how you look at it. And, you know, it's, it's my group on the, the digital side, um, our broadcast and production groups, um, our game day entertainment group, and then our production operations. Um, some of the more technical side of, of, of what we do from a, a production standpoint. Um, but it's been around, you know, long before, uh, you know, I joined, uh, you know, the Vikings in, in 2015. Um, but because of that, we've been working with a lot of these players. We've, um, you know, we've had a lot of consistency in, in the organization. So everybody's been working together for uh, a pretty long time. So the trust is, is there and, you know, it takes, it takes a while to, to build that and, and you need to be there and you need to be, um, you know, talking with the players and, and coaches and, and getting to know them as, um, as people. And, and because of that, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of trust from the player side too. Um, and then right now, uh, as well. And, and during the season, you know, we have a fantastic PR team, uh, that we work with as well, that, that sets up a lot of different things. And there's a lot of different asks on players. So being cognizant of their time and understanding what they have to get done from a, a football perspective and, mm. and not stepping on any toes there is, is really important. But it's a balance and our, our organization does a great job with making sure that, um, you know, everybody's working together towards the, the same goal and, and you're getting the access that, that you need. And, um, you know, our, our PR staff's making players available, um, you know, throughout this whole time on, uh, you know, Zoom calls like this uh, with the media. And, you know, they participate in some of the at home shows and, um, you know, happy hour shows and. Uh, it's it's been great to see not only on some of those shows, but like some of our current players interact with each other um, or interact with a media member who may be on another show. But, you know, we even had a, a current player, Chris Boyd, uh, with a former player, uh, Brian Robison. They were also on one of the happy hour shows talking about how they both went to Texas. And Chris remembers being a, a really big fan of Brian. And, you know, he's like, oh, I'm going to like, like kind of fanboy a little bit, you know, right now. Like, I'm just like freaking out being on a call with you. And those are like the authentic moments. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, some of those things that this current circumstance actually, you know, affords you, it gives you the ability to uh, connect people like that, that may have, you know, they hadn't met before that, but, but seeing them, uh, you know, meet and just be authentically excited to, to meet each other um, is pretty irreplaceable. It's a pretty cool moment. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there when you said that, you know, you have to connect with them on a human level because ultimately, whilst they are these massive superstars who, you know, week in, week out are doing their thing on the field, they are ultimately on a, on a, on a base level humans. And that's, that's mm -hmm. something similar to what we used to do, which is just try to build relationships and rapport with them. And invariably, there were some who were more camera friendly and there were some who were more camera shy. So getting that balance right, I think, is, is hugely important, um, like you said. Yeah. So let's move on maybe towards just in terms of logistics and operations. Um, are there any tools that 
you use? What have you found affecting in, in helping you manage your publication calendars? Maybe just a little bit of uh, insight into how you manage that. Yeah, so I tried to um, to write down a few things because I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget something because normally you do, especially when you have to go through and kind of list yeah. a bunch of things. <laughs> um, but uh, the, probably the main tool, you know, for us from a, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, but communications is really, really important. Um, so, you know, from 2016 to, or sorry, from 2006 to 2015, uh, you know, I was at the 49ers in the last couple of years that I was there. Um, had started using Slack. Um, and that was uh, really, really effective for uh, communication between our, our groups. We even had, um, once Levi Stadium was built, people were kind of in different pockets, even within our same same group. It was kind of spread us out a little bit. Um, and so not used to, you know, before the stadium was built, it was a pretty tight environment with growing staff. And there were times that were all packed into, you know, smaller rooms. So it's like, if I wanted to just ask, you know, our producer or something, it literally was just turning and, you know, asking them, um, you know, jam 12 people in a, you know, a small office with desks around the wall. I mean, I, we worked with, like that for, um, for, for a while as the stadium was being constructed. So you go from a situation like that um, to then needing to be able to communicate in real time. And I've kind of seen how it's evolved for us from that being kind of the, the first use case to then when, um, when I came to uh, the Vikings, staff was spread out between three, four different buildings. Um, you know, we hadn't opened US Bank Stadium yet. We had the main training facility. I had one office at the training facility. Uh, we had offices downtown uh, next to the US Bank Stadium construction site. Um, across from our training facility, there was another building where housing, or uh, sorry, accounting and uh, legal were housed out of. Um, and then we had people ultimately uh, at the ticket office too. So you have four different buildings and, and how people, um, you know, and even in our training facility, people on different floors uh, with our production team and trying to communicate. I just think it's imperative to be able to do that in, in real time. Um, you know, our organization uses Microsoft Teams as, as well. And, and that's been helpful for these types of video calls during the, uh, um, the outbreak and with everyone working from home, uh, that's been key. But I think it really starts with communication. So whatever works for your organization, um, but in, a, in an environment, especially where people are spread out, you think of how that works on game days, you're definitely spread out. There was uh, one time, um, was it two years ago, where I was traveling um, and I was actually working out of a, a hotel room in another city we had um, a couple staff in Philadelphia where we were playing and we had staff in Minnesota and our graphic designers were also in, in Minnesota. So we, we were communicating really between like just in our digital team, probably like five, six different locations. Um, and so to be able to do that and kind of pull it off and, and have uh, no one really know until I just said it now, but we're, like exactly how we were um, all set up at that time. And there were some pretty cool moments, um, you know, that happened at that game that we wanted to, uh, to capitalize on too. We had a defensive lineman intercept a pass and return it for a touchdown and then put on a, um, you know, one of the air masks to get, um, you know, air after the play because he was so winded. You know, those types of things that just become like culturally relevant, you want to be able to capitalize on too. So anyways, I'm rambling, but Slack, uh, you know, and communications key, we use a company called Slate um uh for social media graphics um being able to put some things together um you know pretty seamlessly and our, our our design teams builds a lot of things for us too um so we assemble you know some of that with our our design team as well uh you know a little bit more on uh you know laptops desktops and being able to then transfer it to the phone but that allows you to do it from the phone really easily uh, we use a company called uh rover based out of toronto they do uh test, like push notifications um, and they really build like push experiences. So it's not just, I mean, yes, you can do this, but, and, you know, send a link to open up a, a breaking news article, but you can build, um, you know, welcome messages for the stadium. Think of it like a digital game day guide. Um, or when you go to training camp and figuring out what's located where, um, you know, or, you know, trivia or fan engagement, like small, like micro pieces of content that you can put around players that you just drafted, um, you know, for example, or sponsor offers, um, you know, that's been really helpful for us. 
Uh, and then we use a company called Tagboard for, you know, social um, integration and display, not just in the stadium, uh, but with our happy hour shows. They actually powered the entire L bar uh, that kind of wrapped the Zoom meeting. Uh, and so with that, you're able to, uh, you know, post, uh, you know, social posts in the L bar, uh, rotate sponsor logos. Um, we had a, a ticker, we had a topic bar that we're able to change. So it looks like a, you know, a traditional broadcast and you never, uh, you know, really know that these people aren't doing it in a, uh, you know, fully functional control room. And it's really at the end of the day, a bunch of people on conference calls are trying to watch a, a video meeting and be able to take things live. So um, I'm sure I missed, uh, you know, a few companies that, um, that we do some work with, um, you know, but really functionally. Uh, those are, are, are four of them that, that we use, uh, you know, quite a bit currently. Cool. Um, so I guess the next point to just really touch upon briefly is how you guys use measurement and insight um, in, in terms of how you go about real time publication. So do you have a strategy around how you how, how your content's being consumed? and how then that shapes the next set of content you put out. Maybe if you could just talk to us a little bit about how measurement and insight works for, for, for you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're between measurement and insight, uh, you know, companies right now, there's kind of a change and, um, you know, different products, but a lot of the things that, that we're doing are going to be the same. Um, and, and one of the things that that's key and, and really we started doing, uh, you know, in, in 2015 when I, when I started here, um, is everything that goes out on social is tagged, uh, whether that's Instagram posts or, or Twitter posts, uh, you know, anything on Facebook, we're able to tag that, uh, and we're able to tag that by the type of content, um, the sponsor that's associated with it. And ultimately we're able to have a lot of that as, at our fingertips. So say, a, um, you know, our sponsorship team came by and said they had, you know, somebody who's interested in the, you know, um, uh, on the road content that we, we do are, um, you know, we do kind of an in the lobby show when we travel, say like if they're to use that for an example, we're able to then immediately pull that information in a matter of seconds. So that's not going back and looking at every tweet and every post, um, you know, but we're able to do that in real time. And then we can marry that up with the digital side of, of things, which everything from our, our mobile app to our website, to our connected TV, uh, application are all pulled in through uh, Adobe Analytics. So we can run those reports in a similar fashion. But I think one of the hardest things to do is really marry the two together from, you know, social to from the digital side and putting together one cohesive, um, you know, view of, of each piece of content. Uh, but the way that we have it set up allows us to do it a, as fast as we, we possibly can. Um, and then, you know, we're looking at weekly reports uh, for both digital and social, uh, and then being able to kind of see, um, you know, yes, some things are measured, uh, you know, across the league. And so we're able to, cons to see how we compare to 31 other uh, like businesses in the other clubs. Uh, but the most important thing for us is really, you know, how we compare to, to ourselves year over year, week over week. Um, you know, but being able to benchmark against, um, you know, some of the things that we've been doing in the, uh, in the past and trying to get, you know, a mile an hour faster here or there. Um, and, and those, those things, um, those things add up, um, you know, uh, for sure. And then we have, you know, weekly, or we used to have weekly, uh, you know, meetings when we were in person and, and those have changed to a couple times a day where we can talk about, you know, content strategy around, uh, different areas. Thank you very much. So um, let's move on to technology and innovation, um, a, a fairly broad topic. But let me let me start by asking um, quite, quite, quite an open question. Um, when 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 was it or what, what was the last time that a piece of technology pleasantly surprised you? Um. You know, there's so many things that uh, surprise me now with what technology can do um, and different companies that have found different ways to, to innovate in kind of traditional spaces. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Sacramento 
Uh, so I've been out to the Sacramento Kings arena a number of times. And, you know, some of the things that, that they, they do with, uh, with concessions and, and different vendors and, um, you know, within their space. And I, I think I'm kind of a nerd whenever I go to a different venue because I'm very rarely in my seat and I'm just, uh, you know, running around, um, you know, trying every, every piece. I, I think my, you know, my father who I took to the game, I think was kind of like, Hey, can we get back to the basketball game? And I'm running around trying to like pay for things on my phone. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of teams that are doing really, really cool stuff with, um, with technology. One of the, the things that, um, you know, really surprised um, us was uh, late last season, uh, we wanted to set up um, in-suite merchandise delivery, kind of a big uh, initiative for us. The way the stadium's designed, um, the, concept, the main, you know, merchandise stands, we have one main team store uh, that's located on the general concourse, uh, which is pretty busy, right? And if you're going to a suite, typically that's one of the big perks. You know, you have kind of this easy access area and, you know, you don't have to, you know, fight a ton of crowds and you have this amazing experience in your suite, right? Um, and then there's, you know, you don't have access to the various merchandise stands on the concourse. There is one stand over there, um, you know, on that side, but we really wanted to make sure that no matter where you uh, were located around the stadium, uh, that we'd be able to then bring you the merchandise, excuse me, um, that uh, would ultimately be run to you by one of the, the premium uh, guest services uh, attendants that wear, uh, you know, black jackets and can give you that premium experience and bring it to you in a nice bag. And, uh, you know, that, you know, was something that we talked a lot about and, and, and how we set this up. And, you know, you're, you're not necessarily um, doing something like that with this huge, uh, you know, revenue goal right? Like when you look at what you're like, you, you will make an impact, but it's not going to be this, you're, you're only catering to, you know, a certain, uh, you know, a smaller subsection, um, you know, of your audience. But when you look at it, whether you, um, one of the things we talked about is whether you end up using the service or not, um, perceived value is the same as actual value. So ultimately, if you're sitting in a suite, and I decide not to buy a jersey, but Mo, you and I are in the suite and you buy a jersey and I say, hey, Mo, how'd you, how'd you get your Kirk Cousins jersey? Oh, well, I ordered it on the app. I'm like, oh, that's cool. How'd you do that? We can then talk about it. Even if I never order anything, I'm like, that's pretty cool. In the suites, the Vikings allow you to, to be able to order, you know, merchandise, you know, from your phone. Um, and so my experience then is enhanced, whether I'm the one who, are, who takes a part in that or not. So... Um, if you look at it from the lens of perceived value is the same as actual value, it made a lot of sense to, to us to be able to, um, to, you know, to do this. And we had a small staff, um, you know, that was a part of it. This was a soft launch. It wasn't something that we we're, you know, widely marketing. We wanted to see how, how it went. And it was uh, for the Packers game just before, which, you know, our uh, big rival for the Vikings um, and right before uh, Christmas. So we thought that, you know, with holiday shopping, um, maybe it was a good time, uh, you know, to take advantage of this. But we really had two people that were running it up to the suite service attendants for the entire stadium. We had two people that were, uh, you know, in charge of taking the order and then going to pick up the merchandise as, as the orders came in. So you're talking about, you know, four or five people that are, are really making this happen for an in, entire stadium. And so we were talking about like, okay, well, you know, and we put some promotional items in the suites and, you know, for people to find. Um, you know, so we, we did promote it in that fashion, but we were talking about whether, you know, people would necessarily do this and, you know, people want to be able to try things on and, um, well, are they going to, in a stadium, be able to, you know, they want to look at it they want to touch it, hold it up, see if it fits, um, would people do this? And so, um, I remember that, that group of us, uh, you know, that were, were in charge of trying to pull this off. Um, you know, standing around, uh, you know, one of the team stores uh, the day before the game saying like, okay, well, what's a win? What's kind of our over under? Like, what do we think, uh, you know, people are going at? Like, how many orders do you think we're going to get? So I was like, okay, well, maybe like over under like 10 or 12, you know, like, do you think we get like more than like 12, 15 orders? Like, that, that'd be great. Like, you know, we only have a few people. We just want to see how this goes. It's a soft launch. Like, that'd be great if we just like know this works. It's a win. And so, um, you know, we had some people, you know, go like take the under, 
And I remember saying, well, I think you're going to find one suite where you're going to get like at least maybe like five orders from one suite. Or you're going to get the tech savvy suite that's going to kind of up the numbers for everybody. And I was like, I'll take the over. I think we're going over it. You know, I think we'll have around like maybe 20 orders, like would be fantastic. We had over 60 um, that, that first week. And nobody came close to, uh, you know, predicting, you know, 60 orders just among the suites again. Um, so not like the premium clubs just the main suites of the, uh, the, the building. Um, and so it's just like wildly successful for us, um, you know, and, and something that we did again uh, in week 17 um, had, uh, we kind of changed our strategy. We actually had slightly less orders in that second week, uh, but we changed, um, you know, some of the items based on learnings um, and actually overall sales increased, um, you know, in, in week 17 too. Um, so I think that was one of the, the last times or the most recent time uh, that I was really surprised by one of the things that that we were working on uh, from a technical standpoint went better than we we thought it could or ever really imagined. Again, I think you're right. You know that the the value it adds to that experiential feel for those in the suites is is really quite important. Like you say, you know, you might not have a have a big revenue um, add, but really just making them feel important and making them feel, oh, this is quite easy. I think it's it's really good because it does become a talking point. Mm -hmm. um, on that technology trend, I know you guys have also been dabbling with augmented reality. And I, I also think you've got some really interesting things coming up this season. Could you give us a peek under the bonnet what you have in store in terms of augmented reality? Or is it top secret that you can't talk about? Yeah, I, I can give you a little bit of insight to some of the things that we, we might have going on, um, you know, this year, but we've worked with a company um, called Zapper. They're based out of uh, London, um, you know, on augmented reality for uh, three years now. This will be uh, season four. Uh, and so we, we started, um, we're still a team. We do um, uh, playbooks, a game day magazine that we put on every seat. Um, there's a lot of sponsorship revenue um, tied to it, and it's a good service for fans because they're able to, uh, you know, consume some of our editorial content and, uh, you know, something that we believe in an, as an organization. But we thought, okay, well, if we're doing these, and I looked at it as an opportunity and like putting 60,000 of these on every seat, like we're literally putting, you know, flyers in somebody's, you know, more or less um, in every every stand, there's a way that we could use these to, um, you know, get people ultimately to download the mobile app if they haven't already. Um, cause we went, uh, you know, we're full digital ticketing and, you know, 99% of our, um, of our guests every, every week come in, um, using digital ticketing, um, you know, really outside of some of the, the, you know, the ticket transfers that you do to the other team or, or coaching staffs or, or things like that, you know, without that, we'd be at a, you know, a hundred percent. Um, and, you know, kudos to our ticketing department being out in front of that and believing in uh, digital ticketing years ago that helped us, you know, get to that point. Um, but we wanted to, you know, going back several years, we wanted to incentivize people to download our app and, and be able to go in using the Vikings app and ultimately take this piece of content that we've created and augment that to, to some extent. So if Kirk Cousins is on the cover, you can scan it and then Kirk Cousins comes to life, has some sort of message for you. Or, um, you know, I believe it was an Adam Thielen uh, cover, one of our wide receivers, um, you know, where you could actually tap through and you saw, you know, photos of Adam Thielen through the years, even dating back to like him as a kid, right? So those are ways that we can kind of enhance that experience. And that leads to the main story that's in the magazine. Uh, so we did that for two years. And last year, we had a commemorative uh, cup that we had come to life. Um, so sponsored by Pepsi. Um, and you're able to scan it, uh, you know, through the Vikings app. And we had one cup that was an offensive players themed cup and one that was a defensive players themed cup. And with, you know, using Zapper, you were able to uh, uh, scan the cup. It looked like a player then kind of leaped out of the cup and onto like this virtual football field. And for the offensive cup, you'd swipe left or right to dodge tacklers um, or defensive. You're trying to tackle, uh, you know, the, the runners, the people running at you. You got a score, and at the end of it, we used uh, some of our player celebrations. So uh, Dalvin Cook, um, our running back, uh, he calls himself the chef, um, and so he does the kind of the stir of the pot, um, 
you know, uh, movement uh, quite a bit or like after he scores a touchdown or, or having fun with, you know, a camera or something like that uh, uh, pregame. But stuff like that that our, our fans really engage with and thinks uh, uh, pretty unique and pretty cool. Um, and so you could pick which player's uh, touchdown you wanted to emulate. So you pick Dalvin. He does his celebration. You, the camera then turns on you. You do your celebration, and it looks like you're celebrating on the video board. And then you can share that on uh, social media. So we're kind of taking that to uh, the next level um, this year, kind of, you know, because of the unique situation, we don't have anything kind of locked in right now, but planning for, um, you know, what it looks like if we have commemorative cups, if we don't have commemorative cups, um, you know, how we can take some of that content and use it, um, you know, at some local concession stores um, or just have content in the app available for everybody. Because I think one of the things that, um, you know, I've loved those concepts and I, I think they did exceptionally well, uh, but we wanted to like kind of take those to the masses a little bit. They're a lot more of a, a target audience and, and focused on people at the stadium. Uh, and this this time we want to amplify that and make sure that um, all of our fan base or a larger percentage of our fan base is really able to access those. So um, more to come on that. But, um, you know, I, I, I am pretty bullish with uh, what you can do from kind of a gamification standpoint within the app. And I think you know, we launched a, a mobile app game, uh, Pass or Play, uh, this last season, which is kind of a fantasy light style game, all within the app. But I think AR also kind of fits that mold, too, in terms of how you can uh, enhance or, or gamify or, um, you know, augment the, the fan experience in some, some form or fashion through the mobile app. I agree because it's sticky. It's so sticky and it's so, and it can be so addictive that it keeps bringing people back. So, absolutely. I'm, I'm conscious of time. So just because there's a few questions uh, that have popped up as well. But just before we get on to those, just taking that, that, that AR thread a little bit more and talking about innovative technologies out there, growth companies and startups. How do you go about looking at startups and what are the types of things you're looking for if somebody's coming to you and, and pitching an idea? How do you kind of... Uh, take that so it would be good I suppose for, for 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 those out there to get a little bit of sense of your view on that please yeah absolutely um talk to a lot of companies and there's a lot of companies doing some some really cool things I, I think that the biggest thing for us is is really from a vision standpoint um does their vision align with ours like do they want to grow in the direction that we want to grow um and I think that that's really important um you know right from the start um, you know, and ultimately, you know, you have to build, these are like, I hate the word vendor, right? Like, you know, if you, if you do this the right way, um, you guys should be partners in this, um, you know, and, and from the, uh, you know, the technology side too, I think it's important for them to look at a team and find a team that, that shares, uh, their vision and, and especially when you're starting, uh, and build really deep with them as opposed to building wide. Um, you know, we don't need, uh, you know, a company that tries to be everything to everyone. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times uh, that can lead to you falling short. It is nice if everything wraps up under one umbrella. From a technology stack perspective, that's easier every single time. But one of the things that we've tried to do is really identify, um, you know, the companies that are, uh, you know, best in class and in, in their specific areas. Um, and make sure they really fit our tech stack too. So that the companies play really well together um, is also really important. When we launched our, um, our mobile app game, Pass or Play last year, you know, we have a, uh, it's called Vikings Rewards. It's basically your, your main fan profile, uh, you know, powered by ski data. Um, and so you have a Vikings Rewards login. And so it was important for us when you signed up to play the Pass or Play game, uh, that you didn't have to create another login. You didn't, I didn't want you just to enter your email. It, it's really important that everything kind of funnels back through the same system. So you signed in with ski data to then play this uh, pass or play game, which is powered by a company called sports hub. Um, so having those companies work really well together, um, you know, was important, but we didn't have one company just driving all of that. If, if that makes sense. So um, that's kind of what we try to, to look at and identify if there's a fit early on. One, one of the things that we try to do at your century actually is, is 
we try to do take the heavy lifting away right so my my ethos has always been if you can take one thing away mm -hmm. because it was in your seat you know there was so much going on all at the same time if i had one less headache to worry about then that would be that would be an excellent point um so i think we are running out of time i'd like to just thank you scott for joining us it's been a really great session really great to pop the bonnet open and have a look under and, and get a little bit of insight in terms of some of the some of the challenges and some of the things that you guys are doing there are some questions which indeed come i'm going to yeah. hand over back to mr arno and i'll say my thanks now arno over to you sir thank yeah, you so much Mom. thank you scott and mo and it's not over uh, we've got some more questions before before we go to questions we've got a little tradition at, at sis which is asking you a series of very quick questions with short answers, very much inspired by Inside Actor Studio by Jen Slipton. I don't know if you know that one. Uh, so, Scott, it's improvised, that's a point. Uh, you didn't know the questions before because that's mixing even more interesting. Let's shoot, it'll be fun. <laughs> what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, that's... A very broad. Um, one of the things, uh, I'm not going to give you a one word answer though. Um, one of the things that, that we do um, is we really have one word that um, kind of defines uh, what we want for the year. Um, and so uh, my boss uh, has us all kind of choose a word uh, that's going to mean a lot to us uh, that year. Um, and so uh, the one that I chose uh, for 2020 was Netflix. And I say that because it, it it allows you to, um, you know, as block as Netflix was to Blockbuster. What are we going to do? That's going to be the next thing that that ultimately changes uh, the way people do to to do business in that category. So um, that's my word of the year. I don't know if that's what you were looking for from an answer uh, point of view, but uh, a company that um, I have a ton of respect for 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 what they did in in the industry, and I think is is a pretty much a, a leading example for, for folks on digital and kind of how you can think. Yeah. What is your least favorite word? No. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's a way to accomplish something. I think that you have to, um, you know, no, no is a bad word. There's, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can work together to pull off something that you didn't think you could. What turns you on? Um, we had, uh, I, I think when I get in uh, responses from, uh, fans that they particularly resonated with something that we did, um, after the, the bring it home campaign, I gave a, a presentation uh, here locally in Minneapolis. Um, and there was a, a lady who came up to me afterwards and said she had just moved from the city of Chicago. Uh, she was a bears fan, had just moved to the area, didn't know anybody new to her apartment made new friends because just like the fervor of the city was so wild at that time. Uh, they invited her to, to watch the game. They all had their bring it home shirts and, uh, and beanies. And she said, you made me feel um, like this was my home, uh, you know, because of, because of this and, and everything that, that you guys accomplished through this, this campaign. I'm now a Vikings fan. Um, I have new friends and I feel at home in my city. It was the, um, the best compliment I think I've, I've ever gotten, uh, you know, professionally, um, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. What turns you off? Um, I think egos, I think egos can get in the way, uh, you know, a lot of, of what we try to, uh, accomplish, um, internally. I think if you can leave your, um, ego at the door and, um, you know, not worry about, uh, what someone's title is or, you know, who, outranks who and um and work together as an as an organization um can be really powerful apart from the viking stadium uh which one do you like the most um man that's a really hard question um you know one of the stadiums that i've always really liked a lot and i've hated playing in um is seattle's the um the Seahawks, uh, you know, I, I think I've been a part of one win when we're at Seattle, but still always one uh, that I like going to. I mean, obviously, Levi Stadium and, and having been a part of that 
um, stadium build experience is, is pretty special as well. Um, so maybe those two outside of our own. Atlanta also has a new building. Theirs is fantastic. I uh, can't wait to see what the Raiders and, and the, um, the Rams and, and Chargers do as well. So look forward to seeing those. What sound do you like the most in a stadium? Uh, the skull chant pregame. Um, it's, I think, the best, uh, best fan tradition in the, in the NFL, but kind of taken from, um, and if it's an international audi audience on the call, they probably know the Icelandic uh, you know, war chant and what the soccer team did when they were making a run. I believe it was in the Euro Cup. A number of years ago, but adopted that transition, worked with the Iceland uh, national soccer team that kind of gifted that to us. So now we have a drum, uh, two beats, everybody raises their hands over their heads and then uh, chant skull. But um, pretty wild atmosphere uh, pregame and when they decide to do that uh, at, at various points throughout the game. <laughs> What song do you not like in a stadium? Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if we're, if we're at home, I mean, booze are bad. Um, definitely don't like that. Um, you know, it means you're not doing something right. Um, or, you know, or I, I think at least, you know, if they're booing, at least they still care. So maybe dead silence. Um, then they've just given up. Yeah. <laughs> What would you dream of doing that you have not done yet in digital innovation? Oh, well, in digital innovation, I mean, in my career in general, Um, you know, the goal is always to, to get a Super Bowl. We'd love to be, uh, you know, the team that helps bring a, you know, a championship to the, the state of Minnesota. Um, but I don't have a ton of control over that. Um, you know, one of, one of the, you know, my favorite, uh, you know, times in my career was when we went to a, a Super Bowl with the, uh, the 49ers, um, you know, several years ago now. Um, But I, I think that was just a fantastic experience, um, such a unique circumstance. We ended up losing the Super Bowl, but for, um, for two weeks and for the one you know, week that we were in the city of New Orleans interacting with fans, um, I thought was fantastic. So just to go back to um, you know, a Super Bowl and be able to uh, you know, come up with new and uh, innovative um, you know, campaigns and ways that people can interact, um, you know, Not a better feeling in the world. It's, it's uh, quite a rush. Do you think one day we're going to have a virtual game on Fortnite, like we had Travis Scott? Doing <laughs> Maybe. Um, you know, a lot of things are going virtual. I didn't think there was going to be a virtual um, all-star Peloton race on Saturday on ESPN, but there is. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of things will go virtual. Hmm. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, what profession other than my own? Um, that's tough. Um, I always thought when, uh, I've always been fascinated with flying. Um, had an uncle who was a pilot. Uh, I, was, I knew that I wanted to go into journalism, uh, you know, from the time that I was in high school. And of course that evolved to become uh, digital. But, you know, I always thought I wanted to be a sports anchor. You know, now I'm much more behind the camera, but Um, I've always been fascinated with that too. Like if it was something that was completely outside of what I was doing, um, it'd probably be more that, uh, you know, something in the air. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> <laughs> That's very random. Uh, maybe, well, you didn't screw that up. Um, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I think all of us just kind of want to, you know, leave this place in a, a better, better spot than, than how we found it. So I, I think going out, whether it's, you know, personally or, or professionally, uh, to be able to know, um, you know, that we, we did some good when we were here would be, uh, would mean a lot. All right. Let's go back to the questions, normal <laughs> questions, <laughs> less random. Uh, so, uh, one question for you, one of your big friends and, you know, Rob Alberino, the one who contacted us by the way, thank you, Rob. Uh, mentions that a good storyteller loves people, listen to them. And stories come from both players and fans. How much do you use fan content? Oh, you know, I, so uh, maybe the most recent example um, was just last year during the, um, during the playoffs. Um, but we did quite a bit, especially with fan content. And I've always enjoyed 
um, meeting fans. I think it's one of the best things that uh, we can do as, as digital marketers is, is not, um, you know, always be behind the, the keyboard and um, not just be on the, the, you know, the football side of things. But, you know, when we have fan rallies, whether it was in New Orleans or, um, you know, in San Jose before the 49ers game, um, you know, but we're, we're handing out, um, you know, scarves and rally towels to, to people and kind of put on these, uh, these various rallies we sent, um, you know, we were in contact with all these fan groups that we were getting in contact with on, on Facebook and, and figuring out who was having a watch party. And we worked with the NFL, uh, to send shooters to some of these various, uh, places. So, um, you know, when we, uh, defeated uh, New Orleans in New Orleans, a, a huge win and, and come from behind fashion and, you know, amazing uh, moment with our, our quarterback after the game uh, too in the locker room. Uh, but being able to um, then see all of those reactions from all those different watch parties, uh, we posted, we made a, a video, um, kind of a compilation video and posted that on online. And, um, you know, that did extremely well. Uh, but then ultimately just to be able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one, um, is fantastic to be under, to be able to understand kind of what they're going through or why they like these rallies or how we can improve them. Or I'll ask them, I'm really big on, um, you know, a survey of one. And if you do a lot of surveys of one, um, you know, it, it, it can be pretty powerful and it, you know, you don't necessarily have to send out an email with a, a form to fill out, but, um, you know, being able to, uh, to meet people, um, and hear their stories and, um, just to give a Rob story, uh, you know, while I can, when I was at uh, San Francisco and we played out there, um, we decided we wanted to do, um, you know, a fans, we wanted to find a 49er supporters group in, uh, in London. And I worked with, uh, you know, our contact at uh, 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 Twitter UK. It's like, and he is a 49ers fan. So he said, hey, I know just the guy and, and put us in touch. And so I had a, uh, a phone call with him and I'll never forget what he said, but I just was like, Hey, you know, give me a, it's harder. You know, you guys are, what was that? Like a nine hour time difference from San Francisco. I think it's seven from um, six or seven, depending on the time of year from um, Minneapolis. Um, but those games are really tough to watch. Um, you know, and especially, you know, 49ers games were usually the, the later kickoff. So you're looking at, um, you know, one o'clock Pacific time. So now that game's kicking off at, at 10 PM. Uh, in the UK, that's that's a tough sell to get people to uh, to watch. So I've always admired uh, the dedication of international audiences to be able to do that. But um, I asked him, I said, why did you become a 49ers fan? And he said, well, um, you know, they started giving out these keychains and these, he's like, I think it would be like your American Cracker Jacks, right? And um, a friend of mine got a, uh, and when they're kids, pulled out the, um, the prize that's in there. It's a Dallas Cowboys keychain. And he said, okay, well, then I wanted to go get, you know, my box. And he pulls it out, and it's a 49ers keychain. And so he said, okay, I'm a 49ers fan. You're a Cowboys fan. They were rivals, um, you know, at that time. Um, and so they always had something to, to cheer for and do. But you realize kind of like the touch points that you have with fans and how a lot of teams are, or a lot of people are, are looking for a team to root for. Um, and ultimately how you can – um, do something that's meaningful for them, that they have a reason to root for you. Otherwise, you're just randomly, you know, throwing a dart at a board and saying, you know, I'm going to root for Chelsea, right? Like, but, um, you know, if you have a reason to to root for them, uh, it makes it a lot more impactful. If you didn't have something necessarily handed down from, you know, your uncle or, you know, father, or whoever, you know, in your life, you know, was a, a fan and, and handed that down to you, um, so I, I think that there's a lot that we can do. Oh, and then we also, uh, then when we were out there, um, with Rob and, uh, one of our, uh, producers there at the Niners, uh, Will, um, actually showed up in their home. They invited us in and we set up, set up, uh, cameras and we interviewed all of them and, um, you know, hung out with them. And I, I still connect, even though I'm at a different team now with them on, uh, you know, Twitter, uh, and they've, uh, you know, stayed friends over the years. So, uh, really powerful. Mm. When you, when you decide uh, about your planning, uh, your resources, internal, external, um, what are the key criteria you use 
uh, Rodman was mentioning, for example, that their criteria was both business and emotional connection. What are, mm -hmm. what are the criteria you use to decide and how do you work on budget allocations? Got it. Yeah, I think when we, when we talk about kind of a new concept, um, we talk about it checking, you know, three boxes, right? Is it good for the sponsor, right? Like you mentioned, you know, uh, generating revenue. So ultimately, is it going to, you know, fit what the sponsor is looking to do with the team? Is it good for the fans? So is it uh, creating good content at the end of the day? Uh, and then three, and this is this is a hard part, but I think uh, ties in a lot to uh, what partnerships in, in professional sports could and should be, is, is it good for the team? And how do you align with, uh, you know, a brand that can bring something else to the table? Um, and I think of what we did, you know, James Corden does, uh, you know, the carpool karaoke. And so a few years ago, we did a, a Vikings karaoke and um, Hyundai provided a, uh, a car uh, for it that we could just use for basically a month. Um, and because of that, we got some product shots in there, but it was sponsored by Pepsi, um, you know, had a bottle. Uh, you know, in the center console, but actually, you know, brought a lot to that, um, to that series overall. And because of that, we were able to uh, produce that, but that was fantastic content, seeing players in a, a really different light. Um, it accomplished, um, you know, Pepsi's objective of being tied to kind of music and, and some of the entertainment pieces that are, are value, valuable to, um, uh, to them. Um, and so really, if you can hit on that, and it's a win, 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 um, it's, uh, it, it can be pretty, pretty powerful. So, um, I don't know if that totally answered your question, but those are some of the three main criteria. I think that, um, you know, sometimes as organizations, you, uh, especially as you start new things, um, you're going to run into opportunities where people are going to say, well, is this going to be successful? Right. Um, you know, what are you project for numbers on this? And you're trying something new. You don't know. Um, and, and so sometimes I think it's, it's worth it and it's valuable as long as the expense isn't, um, too outrageous to understand that you're going to have a few years of growth. So whether it's a one or a two year idea, like AR, we got that sponsored in year three, but years one and two, it was not sponsored. Now AR is taking off. We're doing a lot more with it. This is year four where we might have multiple sponsors tied to some of the different activations that we're doing, and it's going to be good content for fans. So I think because of those things, that doesn't happen. We're not in that situation if we don't take those risks in year one and two when we were just doing that on the, uh, the uh, covers of our playbook magazines. I will bounce on that uh, with Mo uh, and your experience at Chelsea. Uh, I understand that in the US, you, know, you can sell a lot of additional inventory to sponsors, correct, uh, Scott? And in Europe and in Latin America in soccer, I believe, and Mo, you're going to give us insights on that. It, it's maybe different because the sponsorship package is a package and it's super hard to get extra money. Uh, how did it work when you worked at Chelsea and what do you think on, what advice would you give to teams, you know, to be able to develop more content sense to the budget of brands? Look, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Tra traditionally sponsorship in football, in soccer football um, has been, there's been a package and within that package there's been certain things for the sponsors and that's just the way it's worked so you've not been able to look at your inventory in a way where you could splice it and commercialize it away from the sponsors however i have a feeling that that traditional sponsorship model is moving away and that's part of the reason why when i was at the club we looked at our entire digital estate and created effectively a menu, like a restaurant menu, you know, where, where items and value and modeled where they were year one, where they would be year three with projections of growth, both within the app, within uh, the website, within social, et cetera, et cetera, and moved towards more of a micro sponsorship model where we weren't necessarily cutting in. Sorry, I pressed my mute button by accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't, we weren't creating, um, we weren't stepping on the foot of the, the, the sponsors, but we were creating new opportunities where we could then commercialize different assets. We would always give uh, the first bite of the sponsors that we had.
but it was moving towards a model where we were effectively starting to look at ourselves more as a publisher rather than a club and being able to then commercialize our assets in a different way. Really, really difficult balance to get right initially, right? Because the big sponsors clearly would want all of that. And then that becomes a commercial negotiation of, okay, well, you've had this much in your, in your, in your package already, that will be an uplift, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're moving more towards a model where sport organizations, sport bodies, teams, et cetera, will start to look at themselves more as publishers and will be able to slice and dice their assets in a different way. What do you think about that, Scott? Because it's very different markets. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're in a little bit of that, that, that same boat too. I, I think that there, um, if you can segment kind of some of the, the sponsorships and find, you know, like how we've sold, right? And, uh, you know, uh, commercialize some of the, the content that, that we've done is it's really centered around like some of the different content series or things like that, that we can create. So one of my goals is, and, you know, talk to, you know, our sales and, and, and partnerships and activation teams that uh, ultimately our goal uh, on the content side or digital or social side um, is to ultimately make sure that they never run out of things that they can sell, right? Like if they're just like, we need more inventory, um, you know, typically we always have stuff that is available to sell. Um, that's the value in, in doing something like a Vikings Entertainment Network and creating these social series on top of, you know, traditional production plus game day entertainment and all the stuff, um, you know, in stadium or, or in arena that you can sell. Um, that's really powerful. And, and part of it, you know, uh, uh, company X may get, uh, you know, something on digital, something on social, something, um, you know, on a traditional broadcaster or TV production, uh, and then have that carried over to uh, in-game. So it could live in all the, those different places. So if they're able to sell across all those different verticals and really have like one team to be able to talk to in your organization for that, not to speak for our, our partnerships folks, um, you know, but I think that that would obviously make things easier on them uh, to be able to know what they have, have available. And then ultimately how to be able to tie that to whatever the brand positioning is for the company that they're talking to. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's amazing what you say, never, have nothing to say, always have something new to propose. I mean, far away in many sports organization of that, uh, but uh, fantastic. Um, another question from David, uh, Misha Newberry is, where, because of COVID, were budgets frozen or cut? Or, and did you have to fight digital budget? Or was it acknowledged from the outset that digital would be critical in this period? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the things, um, you know, we did a virtual draft party, um, you know, a huge event that's normally at the stadium and, um, you know, our, our, our digital and, and social and production teams had to, to work together and our entertainment team, the, the, the group that normally would have been putting on the draft party and, um, you know, working with some of the, the entertainment elements there, uh, you know, all had to work together to be able to, uh, to pull that off and make it a pretty cool event uh, for our fans, even though it was done you know, virtually, um, this year. So, um, I mean, obviously like any business right now, uh, budgets are going to be tighter than they normally would be. And, uh, that's understandable knowing that we don't know exactly what we're preparing for, for yet. You know, there's a lot of, uh, coming up with, um, a lot of different scenarios. So, um, what does it look like if X happens or Y happens? And, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, groups in our organization, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's probably not the most efficient way to do things, but it's something that you have to do is to be able to prepare for all these different scenarios, knowing that three of the four scenarios that you've spent time uh, planning for might never happen or be realized. Um, but all of those things could have budget implications too. And then ultimately when it comes to that, okay, well, if, if budget is, is you know, going to be it at, this or, or, or that for this year. Well, now we can do one of these two things. Um, and so until, uh, until, you know, it's, it's 100% locked in and, you know, uh, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, I think all sports teams kind of have to just be prepared for a variety of options and have a lot of different budget numbers maybe attached to them. Mm. 
Sure. Um, complex situation. Uh, anonymous attendee, uh, how does your social media strategy change platform by platform? And how are you planning for the future with new platforms like TikTok? Yeah, so um, it was, uh, I'll be completely honest here. Um, you know, I was a, a huge proponent of Vine um, back uh, when Vine was around and And we started a, a concept uh, in San Francisco uh, that we called uh, the 40 Viners, um, where, you know, we were doing a lot of things with six second videos. And we worked uh, with an artist who I've, I've kept in touch with and we still work with them uh, at the Vikings. Um, but we started that concept with Vine and, and kind of moved it and, and transitioned after after Vine um, went away and then figured out how we create this kind of short form you know, video series and kind of how that could live on a lot of different platforms and how it kind of evolved to, uh, to fit other platforms. Um, and I think that there's, there are certain elements of, of different platforms that cross over. Some don't, but there are some things that are, are similar. Um, and I think when, uh, when TikTok was, was launched, um, and Vine was, was really like this a little bit too. Um, but, TikTok and then Vine were the only two platforms that I thought were almost completely different than anything else. Like certainly, like I'm not trying to say that Instagram is the same as Twitter. They're obviously different platforms, but as we look towards them, there are certain things that uh, you know still resonate on those platforms from a content perspective. We put a lot of time and effort into the look and feel of everything that we do. We work very closely with our design team. Um, you know, we're not going to you know send something out and that that could look any better right so um curated instagram feed and making sure that that look matches up with um you know the pieces of content that are going out on um you know facebook and 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 twitter uh but it's been interesting to see and we're very active on uh on tiktok um but very different the the same types of content obviously um do not resonate um you know on tiktok Um, we, we hired a, uh, a producer, um, his name's Alex Worley, um, who, uh, manages, um, our TikTok account and comes up with some, uh, really fun and, and fresh ideas for, uh, TikTok that appeal to, uh, to that audience. Um, it's really fun. It's one that I'm interested in and, uh, you know, we've had some success with, and I think we're continuing to kind of, uh, you know, evolve our strategy on, uh, on TikTok. But it is, I, I think, when new pieces of content come out, it's kind of like very similar with Snapchat, right? But then elements of Snapchat are now on, you know, Facebook stories and Instagram stories and um, YouTube, uh, you know, stories and, and things like uh, of that nature. Um, so those types of things can kind of cross over. Those are the things that I'm talking about that like elements of a platform might be different from one to the other. Um, but then you have to acknowledge when something is, is so completely different. Like you couldn't just, um, you know, post any content on Vine. Like Vine, I think to me, um, was a place where like you could almost create magic in six seconds. And it was really like what some of these early Vine artists were um, doing with like kind of quick change stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, the person that we worked even did like claymation six second videos and um, things like that that were really, really cool. Um, but then to be able to understand how each platform is different and then ultimately as platforms catch up or change or add certain features, you know, always trying to figure out like what that means for us. Like, how are we going to take advantage of this? Um, you know, who's going to be the, you know, first club to come up with some cool way to use this new feature. And it's really cool to see. And, um, you know, during those times are kind of like my favorite times to check a bunch of different teams accounts and just kind of, you know, see what they're doing. So. Um, And Hopefully that answered the question. I kind of got off on a tangent there. Uh, and what about Twitch? How do you think Twitch can contribute? Yeah, so Twitch is one platform that we're not on. Um, you know, the, the clubs, uh, NFL clubs, uh, you know, aren't on Twitch. Um, it's something that I think is really interesting. We did a, um, uh, the Phoenix Suns were playing out their, um, uh, their schedule. Um, on NBA 2K. And so we actually worked with the Suns and, and the Timberwolves in the NBA. And we had uh, one of our players compete against a player from the Arizona Cardinals um, as the players for the Timberwolves and Suns. 
which was pretty cool to see. Um, and that was really our one experience, um, you know, using Twitch, um, you know, from a Vikings perspective. Uh, and it was great to see the, uh, the, the content shared on kind of some of our other platforms and what people are responding to. So personally, I think that there's um, a huge opportunity right there. I think, um, especially during this time where everybody's, you know, not able to, uh, you know, get into these big group settings and experience, you know, traditional, you know, sports, um, you know, live and in person, it, it presents an even greater opportunity. So something that we've looked in, into uh, if and when that time comes. Just by curiosity, uh, you said none of the NFL teams. Is that because of a rule of the NFL or because each individual team took that decision? Yeah, I, I don't want to get in too much to kind of some of the, the rules, but um, it's something that, uh, you know, clubs, uh, NFL clubs currently um, aren't, aren't allowed to do. Um, it's probably something that, uh, you know, some clubs, uh, you know, would do. Um, but there are other platforms that we can look to to stream on. And we had a kind of an eSports, um, you know, content series last year, Vikings Arcade, mm. um, where we'd get some of the players to, to compete against one another. And, and that was streamed on YouTube, that, um, you know, and, and had some success, success doing that, uh, going that route, too. Um, but with our one time using it, it was really cool to see, you know, especially what the, the, the Suns and, and some of the, um, you know, the Timberwolves were great to work with. Um, on it too, and, and gave us some really valuable insight. Mm. Okay, a question. Uh, I will not go deeper on that. <laughs> a question from Casper Heiselberg. Teams have shown Hi, lots of <laughs> teams have shown lots of creativity for the COVID, you know, engagement ideas. But how do you treat the balance bit of always aiming for novelty or doing something similar as the teams have done with success? Um. You know, because of some of the things that that we've done, we didn't really have the ability, um, you know, to really gauge kind of like what a lot of other teams were, were doing at, at that point. I mean, we were really just trying to focus on, okay, well, we have a um, virtual draft. Like, what are we going to do? Um, we didn't exactly have like a playbook, um, you know, for for that. I think the WNBA had, uh, they had their draft, I believe, was it like a week or two? Um, you know, before that. So, um, you know, curiously, like I wanted to tune in and, and be able to see, um, you know, what they had done too. But I, I don't think there was kind of an extensive playbook. Um, so a lot of it was new and we were trying to figure out like what a virtual draft party meant to us and, you know, how you can take kind of some other concepts that um, are a little bit more commonplace now, the um, virtual happy hours. That's how we came up with like Everybody's been doing that with their their friends. Um, I think when you know four o'clock hits on on Friday, everybody wants to okay, like the week's done. Let me actually try to see people and um, you know have a have a beverage and and chat with your friends. So we thought let, let's take the same type of concept. Um, you know, Miller uh, Light was the uh, the partner uh, for us. They sponsored um, the draft party, um, and so we were able to to roll them into the virtual happy hour show and make it really social themed, social driven. And we, you know, with that, we really wanted fans to feel like they were watching it along with us, partaking it. You know, there'd be seven guests on the screen sometimes. So, um, you know, and really, really cool, um, you know, guests that, uh, that our team got to be uh, a part of that, but it was highly entertaining. Um, and I, I think that surpassed our expert expectations of, of what that, could be and what that could look like. Um, but I think now is the time in general, like if you have an idea and you think it has a remote chance of success, like, you know, try it. Like there's not a, a playbook for any of this stuff right now, which is, which is really fun. Like, and I, it's a weird time to say that knowing like, you know, how awful things, you know, are around, you know, the U S and, and the world, but for uh, folks on digital, like, you know, you, you have to be able to take advantage and, and kind of seize the opportunity here. Um, and I think one of my favorite things about my job uh, and really kind of why I enjoy digital and social media is it changes all the time, whether it's due to, you know, COVID-19 or new platforms, as you mentioned, starting or, um, you know, uh, technologies changing. I mean, my 
job's not the same from day to day or definitely not from year to year. I mean, even just like looking back on some of the things that you did in like 2010 that you thought were cool, um, you know, and you look back on those and you're like, oh man, like those were the early days of the internet, huh? But like at the time it was really unique and innovative. So I think, you know, some of the the ideas that, that you might have right now at mid Triumph and, and people, people want more content, uh, not less right now. Yeah. If you were still at 49ers after creating the 40 Viners, you would have created for the happy hours the 40 Winers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, might might have had a um, might have had a uh, different connotation, but um, yeah, <laughs> I've got some good wines there at this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Qu question. Last question from Ricardo Souza. Uh, seems like a big fan of you. Scott, one of the best digital campaign ideas I've seen was a Vikings pregame clay cartoon clips. Uh, where did you come up with that idea? Um, yeah, so that was um, the the same person who created, uh, you know, uh, that I, that we worked with. His name's Ian Padgham. Um, now lives in uh, Bordeaux, France. Used to live in uh, San Francisco. Um, but uh, a guy who's become a, a tremendous friend over the years too, and. Um, you know, I'm someone who I like to say I'm a, a creative individual. Um, and then you meet somebody like Ian, um, you know, some of these artists who are, are literally just, you know, coming up with idea after idea and, and the way that they think is just, um, so amazing. Like, I, I think he's a brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and, uh, and so as, as we've talked, um, you know, in terms of how we took that kind of, you know, the 40 Viners idea. Um, and then how we transition that to, uh, you know, when it, when I came here in 2015, um, you know, we started that then in, in, in 2016, um, and, uh, varying, you know, now it's called Viking quest. Um, and that idea has evolved, you know, it was clay char characters, I think in 2016, probably. Uh, and this last year was all, we created kind of a, a 3d miniature helmet character. Um, and uh and so all of these uh characters who would kind of like lead into the games are all these uh they're 3d uh helmet characters for for each team that are in real life spaces so um you could see them walking around on like bourbon street so you see like people in the background and there's these little characters walking around um and so that was kind of our idea to kind of advance this and, and figure out something that could work on um, each platform and, and now, um, you know, we've gotten such good response from the uh, character that we've created that we're kind of using him in, in some other fashions this year outside of just that content series. So, um, you know, just kind of a, it was an evolving conversation over um, six, seven years that, that we've worked with him and, and always trying to, to rethink or reinvent uh, what that concept was every year. So he looked at that from I don't know, 2014, um, you know, in San Francisco to 2020 at the, the Minnesota Vikings, things are, are very different, but that's just how, how platforms evolve and, and technology evolves and, and how we've kind of tried to, to, to rethink things and reimagine it for the markets, the same things, um, you know, you have to, to rethink it, you know, for the different brands too. Cool. Um, uh, he lives in Bordeaux, good wine as well, by the way. Absolutely. Yeah, we um, we were able to visit him uh, in February of this year and, and went to uh, to wine wine country with with him and his wife, Claire. Uh, and, you know, you look back on it and it was like if that trip had been a week or two later, we wouldn't have been able to uh, to go. So somehow we were able to uh, to pull that trip off. But now I hope everybody uh, over there is safe and well. Yeah. So we're going to close now. Um, Mo, do you want a closing word? And after, of course, Scott. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, you caught me by surprise. We, we, had, uh, uh, we hadn't planned that one. Um, look, I, I think from my side, uh, yeah, just, just a, a thanks to, to you, Arno, for the invite. A thanks to you, Scott, for the conversation. Um, as I say, sports is coming back slowly, which is great and, and, and fantastic. Will it come back the way it was a few months ago? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it is going to be a slow road to recovery for sports. I think other sectors have obviously been affected materially and, and, and much more. But I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful for the future of sport, for the future of 
storytelling in sport through different technologies, through different user experiences, through experiential, through different products. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, 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 to seeing um, where it goes. So with that, you know, I'll just thank and hand over to Scott. Yeah, likewise. I mean, just to echo that, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see what teams do, um, you know, this season and when the NHL returns and, um, you know, seeing what some of the uh, the European football leagues are um, are doing and, and how they engage with fans. Um, you know, as, as bad as, as things are, it, it is, it can be exciting from an innovation standpoint and, and how people work through the new challenges that they're, they're faced with. Um, so looking forward to, to seeing what, what everybody does uh, in the digital sports landscape over the next um, couple of years. But um, this has been great. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, normally after these, I'd, I'd look forward to, to saying hi to, to people in, in person, but um, feel free to, to reach out on, on social or anything like that and would be, um, you know, great to, to chat with anybody who, who might have been listening. So thanks so much for having me, you guys. Thanks to the two of you. Uh, great conversation, great insight for everyone. Next is Masterclass Masters will be with FIM K1 next week on Wednesday. Uh, U.S. Olympic Committee Summer Sports VP uh, talking about the process to get more Olympic golds. Uh, and the next is masterclass on Thursday will be with Mauricio Caduza, talent at ESPN, talking about the transformation of storytelling in sport and other topics that you like. So we keep on this moving, we keep on sharing, and thanks to the two of you again. Cheers. Yeah, thanks so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>